shift for a police officer. It started out as nothing. It was innocuous. It was a, it was a little crime. It can quickly take an extraordinary turn. A simple traffic stop went stratosphere within two minutes. Speed is 70 miles an hour. He's outside the petrol station fighting with another male. A routine case. You can start off with something and it can turn into something completely different. Taser, taser! I'm here from you! Can suddenly spiral into a serious incident. Then it switched. He locked the door. She knew that something was very, very wrong here. Stand by, I think we're going to have a decamp. One got out with a baseball bat. There's a ton of campus in the car. They were literally on the rampage. Sometimes the most minor crimes. I was looking for a stolen quad bike found a lot more can crack major cases we were now possibly looking at a serial killer today on big little crimes a routine call out exposes the country's biggest ever lethal weapons hall it was an absolute minefield a simple motoring offence uncovers a kingpin in an international organised crime group. He was speaking to multiple criminals a week. He was organising between three and five different deals at a time. But first, a standard stop and search unearths a terrifying gang responsible for a string of violent robberies. jobs that stay with you um, for life because of the um, trauma involved. But not all big crimes appear that way at first. For Detective Constable Anthony Calvert, this one case started with a run-of-the-mill call-out in rural Staffordshire, where builders are renovating a pub. The workers spotted a car. Looks suspicious. There were two male youths on board the car and two females. And there was something about the behaviour of the occupants of this car that didn't sit right with these builders. A local police officer on patrol also spots the car. Suspicious they might be up to no good, he parks up to keep an eye on them. The, the way they were interacting together didn't seem natural. There seemed to be a certain degree of tension. The officer decides to investigate. As he gets closer, he smells cannabis. So he immediately searches the young men and their car. One of them had possession of a small amount of cannabis, which today isn't that unusual. But as the officer continues the search, things just get more and more suspicious. There were several mobile phones in their possession. There was something not right about this vehicle. For instance, they couldn't find the keys initially. When asked how they got there, they said they travelled there by train. And that's completely disregarding the vehicle that they'd been associated with just moments before. It's all very odd. And very odd for a police officer rings alarm bells. Quick check of the mobile phone, asking questions around that. One of the youths, the males, said um, he'd found it on a train on the way down. Knowing something isn't adding up, the officer runs the number plate through the system. It's a fake registration, and the car was reported stolen a few days ago in Manchester. The minor crime is quickly developing. An area search of the immediate surroundings revealed that the keys had been thrown. They were found close by. That's another alarm bell. They could only logically have come from one place at this stage. The officer immediately arrests the two young men, and the girls in the car with them are taken back to the station too. The possession of drugs and driving a stolen car are both pretty common offences. So the expectation is that this case can be wrapped up quickly. But news from 30 miles away in Manchester is about to turn this straightforward investigation on its head. 
At the same time, Anthony is at his desk in the city. His team are looking for a car that's been involved in a brutal robbery. And they discover it's the same car that's just been stopped in Staffordshire. When that alert went live, we found out about the Staffordshire police stop. A young man has been lured into the car before being driven away and violently robbed by three youths. The victim of this traumatic crime had managed to remember the vehicle registration plate. And lo and behold, that was the very same false registration plates that were affixed to this vehicle now in Staffordshire. A small everyday case is beginning to grow. So the decision was made fairly quickly to transfer the prisoners to our custody here at Central Manchester so we could deal with a wider investigation. A standard stop and search has now escalated to a kidnap and robbery case. CCTV evidence could hold the key to this case. In the UK, we have more cameras than any other European country. It means we're all caught on camera dozens of times a day. The Greater Manchester Robbery Unit look at the CCTV across the city. Can they find the evidence they need to match the car and the young men inside it to the brutal robbery? They've got two men in custody. But the victim says there were three youths involved. Then a breakthrough from the girls found in the car with the suspects. It became apparent that they only just met up with the males on board this vehicle. And it also became apparent from that there was a third male who'd actually gone home before the car had arrived in Staffordshire. This could be the third young man involved in the terrifying robbery, but they still need to identify him. The team used CCTV to build up a picture of what happened on the night of the victim's ordeal. They spot him on camera, and he's with three young men he's just met. He's been invited back to a party. Next, he's spotted at the petrol station with the same three men. The premise here was for the victim, look, we've bought the alcohol, you pay for the petrol. And so our victim quite willingly pays for fuel, gets back in, and his journey continues down these side streets. He has no idea now where he is. Then, the night suddenly takes a sinister turn. Suddenly, the victim's isolated. This is the point. The atmosphere inside the vehicle changes. One of the occupants turns to him and says, give us all your stuff or we're going to stab you. The victim is robbed at knife point. The gang steal anything valuable along with his phone. It's not just his property that's being stripped away here, it's his dignity. It's a way of completely disarming this victim. And they won't let him go. The victim is forced to get out of the car and go into a supermarket with one of the gang. The blonde man is making him enter his pin code to pay for their alcohol. They went to a self-service checkout. It was quarter past midnight. As is standard in a self-service till whenever alcohol's passed through, an alert light comes up. This is the point where our victim makes his snap decision. Perhaps realising this is the best chance he'll get, he snatches his mobile phone back from the offender and immediately says, you're not robbing me anymore, then tells the offender. I'm phoning the police and starts shouting out for security staff to come over and help him. That's enough for our offender. He's quickly on his toes and runs off. I can't imagine how traumatic this was for the victim. 
Now they've got the vital CCTV evidence. The team interview the two young men in custody. Frustratingly, they stay tight-lipped. And there's no sign of the third man police think is involved. But the team are still talking to the girls who were found in the car in Staffordshire. What they're about to tell officers ramps up this crime to a whole new level. Now, critically, the girls stated that earlier, in the hours of that morning, they had witnessed yet another robbery involving the males on board this vehicle. It's a big development. Just how many violent robberies are they responsible for? Later on in the investigation, the net closes in on the mystery third gang member. In our second case today, a common call out to a house leads police to uncover an astonishing stash of deadly weapons. Detective Sergeant Neil Rumsey worked for Suffolk Police for 28 years. A report has just been received about a disturbance at a house in a small, sleepy village. Wyverson is a quiet, picturesque, rural Suffolk setting where crime rates are extremely low. Despite the low crime rates, officers still need to do background checks on the people in the house before they go to investigate the disturbance. The control room operator would normally look at the address and look at who the occupants are and would tell the officers if there are any warning signals. The checks show that a local parish councillor lives there and he holds a firearms licence. Most people who hold firearms licences are avid shooters, maybe involved in controlling vermin or go on shoots. So most people who hold firearms certificates are very, very vigilant. The police arrive to find out what's gone on, but they soon discover much more than they bargained for. And when the officer went through the door, it was quite obvious that there were loads of weapons, even in, just in the lounge where I think they went initially. So I thought, this is not quite right. The owner has got a license for 17 firearms, but by law, they should be kept in a secure gun cabinet under lock and key. Instead, they're strewn all over the house, and there are definitely more than 17. The owner, James Arnold, is immediately arrested. He claims he's keeping the weapon safe to stop them from getting into the wrong hands. Neil heads to the house to investigate. There was weapons absolutely everywhere. And, you know, I've, I've never seen anything like it. The investigation has rapidly developed into something much more sinister than the initial report of the disturbance. A specialist team are brought in to scour the house for clues. They search every inch of every room. And what they discover inside a pantry takes the investigation to new heights. This actual pantry had a, a false wall, and when that false wall was removed, it revealed just a small safe at ground level. And when you crawled through the safe, you went into a void which was absolutely stacked with weapons, ammunition, detonation cord. It was an absolute Aladdin's cave of weapons. The scale of the crime just keeps on growing. There was handguns, rifles, shotguns, submachine guns, rocket launchers, grenades, detonation tape, incredible amount of weaponry, explosives. It, it was a minefield, it really was. It's enough firepower and explosives to start a war. Why has Arnold got such a colossal collection of illegal weapons? 
I suppose my thoughts initially is that the offender here has some sinister motive. Personally, I felt maybe terrorism or maybe something similar along those lines because the accumulation of weapons was so massive that it's hard to really comprehend why someone would have such a massive arsenal of weapons and ammunition. Neil is now in charge of the biggest case of his career and it calls for high-level support. He contacts the Ministry of Defence and the Counter-Terrorism Command. And I mean, this is something that I'd never come across before and neither of many of my colleagues. I mean, explosives are very, very rare in, in the police career. You don't find explosive on a very, well, ever. So this was new territory for me and for my bosses. So exciting, but challenging. What started as a report of a disturbance has led to the discovery of weapons on an unprecedented scale. Thankfully, Neil and the team have got them out of the wrong hands. But the investigation is far from over. A collection this size could cause devastation on a huge scale. Neil needs to find out where Arnold got the weapons from. Could someone else be involved in this potentially lethal conspiracy? Later in the investigation, the scale of the crime just gets bigger and bigger. We actually found 136 handguns, 177 rifles, 88 shotguns, machine guns, and over 200,000 rounds of ammunition, which just shows you the size of this seizure. Massive, massive seizure. In our next case, a simple motoring offence unearths a drug smuggling operation on an international scale. Sometimes, an ordinary day at the office can quickly take an extraordinary turn. This investigation started with a small piece of information concerning who was the registered owner of a heavy goods vehicle and culminated in an international investigation. Martin Clark is the Northeast Branch Commander for the National Crime Agency. We focus on organised crime groups, top tier of, of UK crime. This one case stood out from the moment it landed on Martin's desk. The NCA responded to a, a major human trafficking incident uh, in the south of England. 39 Vietnamese migrants have tragically been found dead in the back of a lorry in Essex. And it's down to Martin's team to track down the owner of the lorry's cab or tractor unit. The tractor unit used in that incident was registered to a Thomas Maher. Thomas Maher was historically involved in running HGV firms. Officers immediately arrest Maher and search his house to see if they can find any evidence to connect him to the horrific incident. But Maher swears blind that he'd sold the tractor cab months earlier and had just forgotten to re-register it. The team examine his mobile phone. Uh, were, we discovered evidence on that mobile phone that actually corroborated his account concerning the sale of the tractor unit. We were able to discount Mr. Maher's involvement in the human trafficking incident. Thomas Maher is released without charge. But Martin isn't satisfied. He's as squeaky clean as he makes out. Investigations show that his haulage company closed years ago. But officers have been to his house and something isn't adding up. He's got a Range Rover and a Corvette, high-value cars. He's got a lot of expensive pieces of artwork, watches, jewellery. He's gone on a number of expensive international holidays, spending over £100,000 in cash, but he has no discernible income. We've done a lot of research around any businesses, where the money can come from, 
and we just can't identify any legitimate sources. Martin's determined to find out how Maher is living a life of luxury when he doesn't have a job. And he quickly uncovers more worrying information. Once we discovered that Mr. Maher was linked to the, the Essex vehicle and we were able to identify previous events in which vehicles registered to Mr. Maher's companies had been stopped at the ports and found to contain illicit commodities. The lorries have been carrying Class A drugs and large amounts of cash. Maher has been ruled out of any involvement with the tragic deaths of the migrants. But his failure to re-register the vehicle has put him on the police's radar. And the investigation is rapidly turning into something much more complex. The team dig deeper. So we believe that Thomas Maher was uh, conducting meetings with associates away from his home address. So we use surveillance as a tool to be able to follow Mr. Maher. These meetings are conducted in quiet areas of restaurants or they're in the open air. They're conducted where it's difficult for anybody to overhear conversations. Maher's behavior is suspicious, but there's no proof he's involved in anything criminal. One of his meetings will soon become very important to the investigation. In this particular image here, we can see Mr. Maher meeting with associate Jason Reed. While the team look further into Reed, they discover from Maher's phone records that he's using an encrypted device called EncroChat to communicate with people across Europe. He could send text messages, send photos to members within an enclosed group on a chat and the individuals within the groups had anonymity because they only ever went by um, a communications handle or a nickname, if you like, which identified them on the, on the EncroChat network. It's a significant development. Why is Maher having conversations he wants to keep secret? And crucially, what are they about? Months pass while the National Crime Agency work with their European counterparts to access the EncroChat network. There were over 100,000 lines worth of communication data, text messaging, messaging, photos. The next challenge was to decipher it. It's painstaking work as investigators trawl through the messages. After weeks of working day and night, they hit the jackpot. Someone going by the username Satirical is clearly involved in organized crime. The content of the, the Encro chat text messaging was incredibly damning. It detailed multiple conspiracies to supply Class A drugs and to launder the proceeds of crime. Martin's hunch is correct. Something much bigger is at play here than simply failing to re-register a vehicle. He's convinced that Satirical is his prime suspect, Maha, but he needs evidence to prove it. They also sought to further conceal their conversations by talking in a coded language. Gone here, he talks about following a 15 run. Next week, there'll be 50 or 20 bits. What that means, 15 or 20 bits refers to 15 or 20 kilos. Um, the likelihood is that's 15 or 20 kilos of Class A drugs. This one details that there's a run on Thursday, landing on Saturday, can do 16 to 20, and at a cost of 2,500. What that means is there's an importation happening this week. The transport is likely to leave Thursday and arrive Saturday and two and a half thousand refers to what someone was going to gain from the transactions. The messages have exposed a huge Class A drug trafficking operation around Europe. They also reveal the gang's plan to hand over some drugs money in Ireland. They decide to strike. Uh, Jason Reed was arrested in the Republic of Ireland involved in the exchange of 600,000 euros in cash. The Garda in Dublin were able to observe this exchange going ahead and seize this cash. It was a very important event for us. Jason Reed was the man photographed meeting Maher just weeks before. The pieces of the jigsaw are finally coming together. But can police prove that he's the man behind the secret conversations? One of the important pieces of work that we had to do at this point was to attribute the handset to Mr. Maher. 
In order to do that, we looked at the photos that were recorded on the handset. And within those photos, there were some images of a bedroom with a, a large plasma screen TV on the wall. When Mr Maher's house was originally searched several months before, the bedroom was photographed. Within that bedroom was the television that was on the wall. We begin to build that bigger picture that Mr Maher was indeed the user of that Encroach chat telephone and also that he was the, the call handle satirical. It's a breakthrough. It is Maher behind the messages. The team are building a strong case against him and he has got no idea they know any of it. We were able to establish that Mr Maher was that professional facilitator for the various crime groups. He was speaking to multiple criminals a week. He was organising between three and five different deals at a time, and it might be moving drugs from Europe into the UK and moving cash out. And he didn't really have to move from his sofa to be able to achieve it. Maher has made a huge £1 million from his criminal activity. Martin immediately arrests Thomas Maher. Frustratingly, he answers no comment in the interview. But with such damning evidence against him, he's got no way out. Thomas Maher pleaded guilty to four offences. Two offences of conspiracy to supply Class A drugs and two offences of conspiracy to launder the proceeds of crime. And he was sentenced to 14 years and eight months imprisonment. Jason Reed is jailed for seven years for money laundering and possessing the proceeds of crime. In total, the gang identified through the EncroChat device a sentence to a combined 27 years in prison. What started as a failure to re-register a vehicle ended up bringing down a large-scale organized crime gang. This was the first investigation that received a guilty plea based on EncroChat data alone. So it was quite a groundbreaking moment that the evidence obtained from the EncroChat data had prosecuted a really high-ranking individual. Back in Manchester, a routine stop and search has uncovered a gang behind a series of violent crimes. Detective Constable Anthony Calvert and the Greater Manchester Robbery Unit have got two young men in custody. They were stopped in a stolen car and have been linked to kidnapping and robberies. The first victim said he was attacked by three youths, but police can't find the third suspect. They've got a CCTV image of his face, but don't know his name or where he's hiding. It's quite rare that we come into possession of full facial imagery at a close distance in very well lit conditions, in, in full colour. And that's what we had. Now that came into play now. We now know that this vehicle was involved in this kidnap attempt where the third offender was present. The team are getting closer and then they make another breakthrough. We looked at this image and research indicated he was the brother of one of the offenders in custody. Anthony immediately arrests the third young man. He now needs to link the three youths to all three crimes. The stolen vehicle and both robberies. Police trawl the CCTV from the area the car was stolen. These are the steps captured in the CCTV footage that we seized. The victim went down these steps and was robbed just out of the coverage of the cameras. The offenders run up once they'd robbed from him his vehicle keys. We could see from that footage the orange flash associated with the car then being unlocked and driven away at speed. It's a major development. But they need a clearer image to properly identify the gang. And the CCTV continues to give them vital evidence. Soon, 
another breakthrough. Footage from a shop shows a clear image of the three men, and they look all too familiar. Looking at the image of this offender at this supermarket, that bright coat immediately rang a bell, and drew us straight to a stop check that had happened right in the middle of this offending story. It was just after the robbery of the car and just before the kidnap offence. The three young men had been stopped earlier in the week by officers from Anthony's team. The image here is still taken from uh, body-worn video footage uh, from the police in plain clothes who stop-checked the three suspects you can see here. In terms of evidential worth of this image, I can't really overstate how important it was. It was very important. You have the visual continuity of the clothing. You have quite clear facial shots. And it all just ties it together. Anthony and his team can now clearly link the gang to stealing the car and the kidnap and robberies. Now they need to prove that they haven't violently robbed just two people, that there are other victims too. Now we turn back then to the phones that have been seized from the male suspects by Staffordshire Constabulary. We were quickly able to establish that they belonged to two other victims. One of the victims was the one the girls had witnessed in the car. The scale of the crime is getting bigger by the minute. They trace the victim who the girls had witnessed using the mobile phone stolen by the gang. He too was lured into the men's car with the promise of a party. He confirms he'd been violently robbed. The girls are already on board. They see this lad come into the back. They don't know who he is or why he's there. And then all of a sudden, they witness the robbery he's subjected to. His property's demanded from him. His bank cards are taken from him in a card holder. His mobile phone is robbed from him, all under threat of violence. And then, in order to get the PIN number for the card, as well as threats being made, the vehicle is sat in is driven erratically to scare him. A standard vehicle check has uncovered a web of terrifying robberies. But this time, there's one difference from the other victims. There are witnesses. The victim, understandably, was so shaken, he felt he wouldn't be able to identify the offending parties again. What if the two girls were able to pick out the victim himself, thereby putting him in that car at that time as the victim of that robbery? We secured imagery of the witness, the victim himself, and we put that amongst others who look similar. And sure enough, both girls were able to identify our victim. It's a great result. And not only that, two of the victims and the girls from the car are also able to pick out the criminals in an identity parade. What started with a regular stop and search has exposed a gang behind four horrifying robberies in just six days. They've got a mountain of evidence against the young men, but they plead not guilty in court. They wanted to run a trial, which is their right to do. However, eventually, it was accepted on the full facts, and slowly but surely, each and every defendant in this case pleaded guilty and received a considerable jail term. The gang receive a combined total of 11 years in prison. What these people went through will have changed them for life. Um, if we can in any way help or help resolve those issues by giving just a small amount of closure, by bringing to justice those who have wronged them, then I'm incredibly pleased with what we've achieved. It's time to wrap up our final case, where a report of a disturbance in a rural Suffolk village has blown up into a massive investigation. DS Neil Rumsey and his team 
have discovered an arsenal of dangerous weapons at the home of a local parish councillor. And now they found a secret room with even more inside. This property was set in several acres of land. It was clear that he had secreted weapons in order that they shouldn't be found. The whole of the land had to be searched. While the mammoth search kicks off, Neil needs to speak to the man in custody, James Arnold. I was involved in the uh, intelligence interview with this person, and the purpose of that intelligence interview was to try and find out from him why he had these weapons and where the weapons were from. Arnold claims he was keeping them from getting into the wrong hands and maintains his innocence. The team have finally finished a forensic search of Arnold's house and grounds. Neil can't believe what they're dealing with. We actually found 136 handguns, 177 rifles, 88 shotguns, machine guns, 400 detonators, some of which could be activated electronically by mobile phones. We've got over a thousand feet of detonation cord, which is used obviously for explosives. A tank missile launcher, rocket launcher, and over 200,000 rounds of ammunition, which just shows you the size of this seizure. Massive, massive seizure. It's the largest stash of illegal weapons to be uncovered in England. And disposing of them is no easy feat. Some of those explosives there couldn't even be transported away from the premises because of the risk and had to be exploded in the, in the grounds of the property. The villagers are blissfully unaware what danger lies on their doorstep. The public need protection from this, particularly people living in close proximity to the address. But Neil is still no closer to knowing why Arnold had this enormous collection of weapons. He needs to find out where they came from. The name of Anthony Buckland, a registered firearms dealer from Norfolk, uh, had cropped up. A number of guns at Arnold's house are registered to Buckland. So why does Arnold have possession of them? Some of the weapons found at the address in the village in Stowmarket should have been in the custody and control of the firearms dealer, Mr. Anthony Buckland, in Norfolk. But clearly they weren't, and this was a cause for concern. Neil urgently needs to speak to the firearms dealer. I went to the address, and the door was answered by a man who identified himself as Mr. Anthony Buckland. He said to me, you're not coming in and was quite um, vociferous. It's a worrying development. Why won't Buckland let Neil inside? What has he got to hide? I said, well, we will be coming in, and we'd like to come in without using force. After a tense few minutes, Neil and the officer are finally let inside. They tell Buckland they need to search the property. Mr. Buckland's whole demeanour just suddenly changed and became quite fidgety and nervous and picked up a crowbar, a, a screwdriver, and tried to open a large metal cabinet. I didn't really know at that time why this cabinet was significant, if it was. Buckland knows the game's up and reveals a number of illegal weapons. One such weapon was a walking stick gun. Now, a walking stick gun is, is what's known as a disguised weapon. And it's exactly as it says, it's a walking stick. And in the crook of the walking stick is a trigger mechanism. And at the end of the walking stick is the actual chamber where the bullet is fired from. Buckland is immediately arrested for possession of illegal weapons and other firearms offenses. As a registered firearms dealer, Buckland...
has to keep an official firearms register. But is it up to date? It appeared that the register had actually been redacted and altered. So this really took our investigation on a completely another level because we were now looking at other offences. The number of offences is growing by the minute. Buckland could be handing out lethal weapons to extremely dangerous people. And there's no record of any of it. And it all started with the report of a disturbance in a house. What started out as something very small is beginning to grow and develop. A specialist firearms officer has spotted that Buckland is converting illegal semi-automatic weapons and selling them as legal firearms. Law-abiding citizens around the country could be in possession of illegal weapons without knowing it. To be converting weapons and selling them to unsuspecting customers in this way was quite a sinister act. Buckland has been a well-respected member of society for years, but the facade is quickly crumbling. Buckland claimed to have had a knighthood awarded by the Queen. This wasn't the case. This wasn't true. He claimed to have served in the SAS, following in his father's footsteps. This wasn't true either. This, to me, gave us a clear indication of the character we were dealing with, a fantasist a person who was living a lie, who had sucked in members of the public because they saw him as a fine, upstanding member of the public and had purchased weapons from him. Despite all the evidence, Buckland denies any wrongdoing. But Neil knows he's got everything he needs to charge him. Mr Anthony Buckland was charged with several offences of transferring a prohibited weapon, fraud by misrepresentation, uh, possession of a disguised weapon, that was the walking stick gun, and transfer of a prohibited weapon. James Arnold, who had an arsenal of illegal weapons in Suffolk, is also charged. But before his case goes to court, he dies from a serious illness. The police will never know why he had so many lethal weapons. Anthony Buckland's trial lasts three weeks. He is convicted of fraud in selling prohibited weapons and sentenced to six years in prison. It all began as a report of a disturbance in a small sleepy village and ended uncovering the largest illegal weapon stash found in England. I've never ever been involved in an investigation that started with a minor incident and just snowballed into something so huge. And to be quite honest, it will live with me for the rest of my life. Join us again on Big Little Crimes, when everyday policing... I noticed that it was a left-hand drive car and it just stood out as being wrong. Uncovers extraordinary crimes. As soon as she got an opportunity, she jumped out of the car as she was away on her toes. And cracks major cases. When we work together, we can take out serious criminality. Now I'm in the East Coast, so you wanna